Okay, folks, um, as I said in the devotional yesterday, I want to speak about hearing the voice of God. Now, a couple of weeks ago, somebody sent me a video with a man just explaining how he spoke to his little newborn baby and the response that was there and how important it was to hear the voice of the Father. Uh, I did send it to one or two of you, and I, know, uh, I had one or two of you send it to me. And then last, uh, well, just probably more than a week ago, I pasted this one on the uh, church group where... And a lawyer had gone to the Aleutian Islands for a case, and him and uh, someone else was in the plane with the pilot, and the pilot passed out, and they had to rely on the traffic controller to guide them into land. And the whole thing was sort of related to hearing the voice and not seeing who's speaking. And the spiritual, the spiritual application, obviously, is uh, if we just prepare to listen to the Lord, um, he'll bring us in safely. So um, I want to speak along those lines this morning. And in Proverbs chapter 2, verse 1 to 5, it says, My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding, yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. So over and over in Scripture, we see very clearly that God does not reveal himself to the casual inquirer. If you seek for it like silver, search for it like hidden treasures. Um, I'm sure some of you have seen uh, films of how they mine gold. And I mean... Uh, you mine huge amounts of uh, soil to actually extract just a few grams of gold. A lot of effort goes into it. And that's, that's the kind of effort that the Lord's expecting us to put in, to get into a relationship with him. Because he has said that he, we'll seek him and find him when we search for him with all our hearts. So God reveals himself to the hungry, to the thirsty, and to the willing, and by the willing, I mean those who are not just willing to seek him, but those who are willing to do his will when he reveals it. And that's why it says in John 7, verse 17, anyone who chooses to do the will of God will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. So the willingness has to be there first, the desire to do what God tells you to do. It's not a case of, Lord, tell me what you want me to do, and I'll decide whether I'm going to do it or not. It's a case of, Lord, tell me what you want to do. Whatever it is, I'm going to do it. So there is to be first a willingness and a desire to know God's will before we know it. And then, as I said in the devotional yesterday, is there a desire in our hearts to hear from God? Or are we quite happy hearing secondhand? And here in Deuteronomy 5, it tells us of this encounter that the Israelites had with God on the Mount Sinai. I want to read it to you. There are, these are the commandments the Lord proclaimed in a loud voice. To your whole assembly there on the mountain from out of the fire, the cloud and the deep darkness. And he added nothing more. Then he wrote them on two stone tablets and gave them to me. When you heard the voice out of the darkness, now this is obviously Moses addressing the congregation of Israel. While the mountain was ablaze with fire, all the leaders of your tribes and your elders came to me and said, the Lord has shown us his glory and his majesty. We have heard his voice from the fire. Today we have seen a person can live even if God speaks with them. But now why should we die? This great fire will consume us. If we die, we, and we will die if we hear the voice of the Lord our God any longer. For what mortal has ever heard the voice of the living God speaking out of fire as we have and survived? Many Christians, just like the children of Israel, have no desire to hear from the Lord firsthand. They're quite happy to sit back and let someone else do the praying 
Let someone else do the reading of the Word of God, the studying of the Word of God. And they simply want to sit back and receive it secondhand. And consequently, they miss out on a face-to-face -face encounter with God. And very often, they end up being led astray by false teachers because their relationship is based on what they see and what they hear from someone else other than God himself. Now, Oswald Chambers, some of you may have read the devotional. I think his wife got together of a whole lot of different things that he did. He didn't do the devotional as we know it called the utmost for his highest, but a real blessing. He lived from 1874 to 1917 and uh, had some real deep insights into our relationship with the Lord. And this is what he says. We show how little love we have for God by preferring to listen to his servants rather than to him. We like to listen to personal testimonies, but we don't want to hear God himself speak to us. Why are we so terrified for God to speak to us? Perhaps it's because we know that when God speaks, we know we've only two choices. Either we will do what he says, or we'll tell him that we will not obey. But if it's simply one of God's servants speaking to us, we feel obedience is optional, not imperative. So if it's the pastor, or if it's Moses, or whatever, we can decide whether to do it or not. But if God speaks to us directly, well, you've either got to choose to obey him or say you're not going to obey him. So who do you want to hear? Do you want to hear Moses or do you want to hear God? And the reason why so many who profess Christianity are backslidden or don't want to go to church anymore is because they've been looking at man. And uh, they've got their eyes on Moses. And you know what happened when Moses... The Lord spoke to these people out of the fire, and they said, don't speak anymore, rather speak to Moses. Forty days later, after Moses had gone into the mountain and come back, they said to Aaron, make us a gold calf, and they were worshipping the golden calf. That's unfortunately what happens to people who don't have a relationship with the Lord. It doesn't take them long to forget and to go astray, and they fall back into worshipping the world and the systems of this world. So our relationship must be based our walk with God must be based on a relationship with him and not with some pastor or some other leader. And so they go on to say to Moses, go near and listen to all that the Lord says, then tell us whatever the Lord tells you, we will listen and obey. The Lord heard you when you spoke to me. So what happens is Moses goes up and he goes and listens to the Lord for 40 days. And these very people who said, we don't want to hear from God, you go and hear what he says. Now start worshipping an idol. We will listen and obey. The Lord heard you when you spoke to me. The Lord said to me, I have heard what his people said to you. Everything they said was good. Oh, that their hearts would be inclined to fear me and keep all my commandments always, so that it might go well with them and their children forever. But you know, in Hebrews 12, it reminds us that they, they didn't listen. But it also reminds us that we've got a far greater responsibility than they did. It says, see to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused, to, uh, refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time, his voice shook the earth. But now he has promised once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. These people had a huge responsibility placed on them, and all they knew was a lamb was killed to pay for their sins. You and I know that something far greater than a lamb has died for our sins. That pointed to the Son of God himself coming and taking our sin upon him. What a greater responsibility lies on us. Now, communication is vital and important. You know, we're involved in a spiritual war. Um, Paul says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but uh, against uh, principalities and powers. And in any war, 
communication is the lifeline of the army and uh, makes the difference between victory and defeat but there has to be two-way communication it's no good just having uh, you can hear one way and you, you can't communicate back and so in psalm 66 18 it says if i regard iniquity in my heart the lord will not hear me so straight away if we have allowed for strongholds and sin to be harbored in our hearts, God's not going to hear us. So that's communication line is broken. And we must hear the Lord. So it's not only a case of God hearing us, but we must hear the Lord. And in John 10, it says, the gatekeeper opens the gate for his sheep. Oh, the gatekeeper opens the sheep for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought all, when he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them in also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. Now, quite a while ago, I came across this article and I think I actually shared it, but uh, probably was about 10, 11 years ago. So I'm sure you, that those of you who might recall it could do with a refresher. Okay, imagine you are hired to open up an office, office in Anchorage, Alaska. Your new boss gives you a high-tech looking two-way radio, a policy and procedure manual, and tells you that you will receive instructions once you arrive, and off you go. Upon arriving, you hear your boss's voice come over the radio, your radio saying, I will communicate to you through this radio unit. But take note, our competitors, our enemies, also have access to this channel. They will try to impersonate my voice with false messages to thwart our purposes. Oh no, you panic. Then how will I know if it is you or the enemy giving me instructions? Your boss's voice comes back over the radio and says three ways. First, consider the situation. Check every message supposedly from me against the policy and procedure manual. Since I wrote it, I'm not likely to ask you to violate it. Also, if I'm not talking, don't focus on the noise, pretending that I am. If I'm not speaking, let the manual be your guide. Don't let any impersonating voice mislead you or even your own overactive imagination. Second, since the manual does not cover every situation, you will have to get to know my voice. I know this will take time, and so I'm not likely to ask you to do anything radical until we both have some low-risk successes under our belts. Remember, I understand the, the situation perfectly well, so I'll go slow at first. A time will come when I will be able to tell you to do the wildest things, and you will know it's me. In the short term, you must be trained through low risk experience. And that's why, you know, the Lord says, he who is faithful in that which is least is faithful in much. We are proved in the small things. Third, over time, my overall purpose for your work will begin to come into focus. You will begin to see the grand strategy in the policy and procedure manual and the overall pattern of my true instructions. When this happens, you'll know instantly if what you hear through your unit is of me, just your imagination, or enemy misinformation. False instructions will begin to appear silly to you, so take heart and get to work. After reflecting on this for a few moments, you hear your boss's voice again on the radio unit. Take all the money from the petty cash and give it to the next person that walks in. No questions asked. Hmm, you look in the policy and procedure manual, and this is specifically forbidden. Besides, you know your boss wouldn't tell you to do something that risky right off. 
And also, there was a certain twang to the voice, an appeal to something different within you, and a plan that was not in the long-term interests of the company. So even though you are on a hostile channel, you are beginning to have hope that you can indeed do this job. Very, very relative to our own walk with the Lord. Now, prayer is very often seen as somebody saying a whole lot of things to God. I believe that prayer is mostly hearing from God. More and more as I've looked into the matter, I've realized that we don't have to always be saying a whole lot of things. Prayer is hearing from God. Ecclesiastes 5, 1 to 2, guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Go near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools who do not know that they do wrong. Do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven and you are on earth. So let your words be few. Imagine giving people that kind of counsel. You must pray a lot, but don't say a lot. Why? Because prayer is listening. Prayer is letting God speak to you. To hear from God, we must be in submission. So there are things that are going to hinder uh, us hearing from God. It says about Jesus in Hebrews 5, 7, during the, the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. If we harbor sin in our hearts, God won't hear us. Come and hear, it says in Psalm 66, all you who fear God. Let me tell you what he has done for me. I cried out to him with my mouth. His praise was on my tongue. And here's that verse that I gave you earlier on. If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But God surely, God has surely listened and has heard my prayers. Praise be to God who has not rejected my prayer or withheld his love from me. There's other behaviors that hinder sin. It says in 1 Peter 3, 7 that hinder our prayers and hinder our communication with God. And it says husbands in the same way. Be considerate as you live with your wives. Treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as is with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. We must not ignore the plight of the poor and the needy. Whoever shuts their ears to the cry of the poor will also cry out and not be answered. Proverbs 21.13 Isaiah 1, 15 to 18, when you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I'm not listening. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Learn, uh, stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Busyness stops us from hearing God. I like this one, yeah. My wife said I don't listen to her. At least I, I, I think that's what she said. At times I miss what my wife tells me. I'm not intentionally blocking her out, but I realize sometimes that she's actually been saying something that I haven't heard what she's been saying because I've been focused on something else. How many times has God spoken to us and we're distracted by something else? We come to church and it doesn't take too long for us to fall asleep because we had a late night. And the things of God don't really matter so much. I wonder why I don't hear the voice of the shepherd anymore. Is that a picture of you? So busy filling your life with noise and activity that you don't hear the voice of God.
And we've got to hear not just with our physical ears, we've got to hear with our heart. The big problem that confronts modern Christianity today is not a God that doesn't speak. But Christians, just like the Jews of old, don't listen. Jeremiah 6.10, to whom can I speak and give warning? Who will listen to me? The ears are closed, so they cannot hear. The word of the Lord is offensive to them. They find no pleasure in it. Zechariah 7, 11 to 13, but they refused to pay attention. Stubbornly, they turned their backs and stopped their ears. They made their hearts as hard as flint and would not listen. listen, and would not listen. So the Lord Almighty was angry. When I called, they did not listen. So when they called, I would not listen, says the Lord Almighty. Here, when we see the encounter that Samuel had with Saul after he had disobeyed God and he had done certain things so that he could make sacrifices to the Lord. Samuel's response in 1 Samuel 15, 22 was, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings as much as in obeying the voice of the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice. Sometimes people think that by doing something, by giving some gift, by performing some works, by doing some service, that they can bow favor with God. But it doesn't cover your disobedience. It's not a substitute for disobedience. God wants our obedience. He doesn't want sacrifice. He wants you to do what he tells you to do. Obedience is the response that keeps the dialogue going between ourselves and God. If we refuse to do what God tells us, we risk deafening our spiritual ear. As I said, we're in a battle, and we need to listen to our commanding officer. John 14, 21 to 24, those who accept my commands and obey them are the ones who love me. And because they love me, my father will love them, and I will love them and reveal myself to each of them. Jesus replied, all who love me will do what I say. My father will love them, and we will come and make our home with each of them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey me. And remember, my words are not my own. What I'm telling you is from the Father who sent me. And Jesus' response to his disciples in Luke 6, 46 to 49 was, why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, when you don't do what I say? Because Lord means master. I will show you what it's like when someone comes to me and listens to my teaching and then follows it. It is like a person building a house who digs deep and lays foundation on solid rock. When the floodwaters rise and break against that house, it stands firm because it's well built. Anyone who hears and doesn't obey is like a person who builds a house without a foundation. When the floods sweep down against that house, it will collapse into a heap of ruins. So if you want to hear from God, you must be a listener. Mark 4 Verse 23 to 25 makes it quite clear that when we stop listening, God stops speaking. So if you haven't heard the voice of God in a while, it's very possible that what God has told you to do, you haven't been doing. And then God stops speaking. He who has ears to hear, let him hear, it says in Mark 4. Consider carefully what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be given to you and even more. He who hears will be given more. He who does not hear, even that which he has will be taken away. And so you find that Christians who disobey God, what happens is their conscience starts actually hardening. And things that they used to feel convicted about, they don't feel convicted about anymore. So you either move in one direction or the other. Somebody has said Christianity is like going uphill without a handbrake. As soon as you think you can stop still, you start rolling backwards. In Mark 6, verse 18 to 20, Herodias nursed a grudge against John the Baptist and wanted to kill him. But she was not able to because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and a holy man. When Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. And you know, there are some people who like to turn on T, uh, TBN or some Christian channel and they like to listen to uh, ministry and all the rest. 
That doesn't show that you're a spiritual person. This man is a wicked man. He actually had John the Baptist beheaded to keep Herodias happy. He liked to listen to John, but he didn't hear. And so when Jesus stood before Herod, he didn't say a word. When Pilate heard that Jesus was from Galilee and Herod was in Jerusalem, he sent Jesus to Herod so that Herod could cross-examine him and see if there was some fault. And so in Luke 23, verse 8 to 9, it says, when Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased because for a long time he had been wanting to see him. Sounds like a very good guy, this guy. From what he had heard about him, he hoped to see him perform a sign of some sort. So in other words, he actually had faith. He believed Jesus could perform some kind of miracle. He plied him with many questions, but Jesus gave him no answer. Herod is known as the man who silenced God. But he's not the only man who silenced God. There are many people who silence God because they don't listen. Oh, they might want to see a miracle. They might like listening to sermons. But they don't put them into practice. Isaiah 6, 1 to 8 says, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. This is Isaiah in the presence of God. When he says, I saw the Lord, and he was high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. The angels cried, Holy, Holy, Holy. And I said, Woe unto me, for I am an unclean man. And I dwell amongst people with unclean lips. And an angel comes and touches his tongue. And then the Lord says, whom shall I send? And he said, I'll go. And then this is the message that God gave Isaiah. He said, go and tell this people, be ever hearing. But never understanding. Be ever seen, but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused. Make their ears dull. Close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. That's what happens when you ignore the voice of God. When over and over God speaks, and you don't obey. And so in Matthew 13, when Jesus explains the parable of the sower, well, he explains it to his disciples, and then they ask him why he speaks in parables. He says, this is why I speak to them in parables. Because seeing they do not see, hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. In Ezekiel 33, 30 to 33, the Lord speaks to Ezekiel and he says, as for you, son of man, your people are talking together about you by the walls and at the doors of the houses, saying to each other, come and hear the message that has come from the Lord. So these were people who liked going to church. My people come to you as they usually do and sit before you to hear your words, but they do not put them into practice. Their mouths speak of love, but their hearts are greedy for unjust gain. Indeed, to them you are nothing more than one, than one who sings love songs with a beautiful voice and plays an instrument well. For they hear your words, but do not put them into practice. Don't you think that we can relate to that in our modern day era? Over and over, God has warned us. God has spoken to us. And we have the scriptures like this to warn us. And yet we fall into the same traps and do the same things. So I want to ask you, have you heard the Lord knocking lately? Because the Lord knocks at the door of the lukewarm church. The Lord knocks at the heart of the lukewarm Christian. Revelation 3.20, which is written to the church of Laodicea, the lukewarm church, that he says, I wish that you were either hot or cold. 
but because you're lukewarm, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. He says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. But Jesus will not speak guidance and direction into our lives through a closed door like some unwanted visitor or salesman. Are you too busy with work? Maybe even ministry that you have no time for the Lord, but you've got time for your favorite TV programs and gym and all the rest. But the Lord gets your leftovers. He gets the scraps of your day when you're worn out and you're ready to fall asleep. So I want to speak about opening the door. Okay, I see I've repeated myself there. Maybe it's for emphasis. Opening the door, the door. I must remember to take that out. Opening the door to Jesus. Song of Solomon 5, 2 to 6 says this. And this is the Shulamite woman speaking. Remember, this is a picture of the Lord and his bride. I've taken off my robe. Must I put it on again? I've washed my feet. Must I soil them again? Why? Because her beloved is knocking at the door. My beloved thrust his hand through the latch opening. My heart began to pound for him. I arose to open for my beloved. My hands dripped with myrrh. My fingers with flowing myrrh on the handles of the bolt. I opened the door for my beloved, but my beloved had left. He was gone. My heart sank at his departure. I looked for him, but, he, but I did not find him. I called for him, but he did not answer. And uh, looking at BibleTools.org, a website, their, their take on this passage of scripture, I found quite good. The second dream sequence is more tragic. Once again, the Shulamite sleeps, but she is somewhat aware of her surroundings. The beloved knocks on the door, and beckons her to let him in. She, however, complains that she has just bathed and undressed for bed. She does not want to dirty herself again. When she sees him trying to open the door himself, though it is locked from the inside, she relents and gets out of bed. When she finally unbolts and opens the door, the beloved is gone. Due to her lethargy and unwillingness, he had turned away in disappointment to feed his flock. And so Pat Higgins on this article says, are we opening the door? Here are some easy tests. Are we diligently praying, studying, meditating, fasting, not allowing our deceitful and sleepy natures to accept excuses for failure? Are we opening our minds and our hearts during services by being alert? And eager. Are we wise or foolish virgins? Have we been lulled to sleep and see no reason for urgency? God knows the true answers to each of these questions, do we? I found this on another website, ebible.com, about opening the door to the devil. Ah, opening the door to the Lord. Hopefully, we won't be opening the door to the devil. <laughs> The Lord calling you into a relationship with him. The Lord is calling you into a relationship with him. All you need to do is open that door to enter into a relationship with him. Start reading the Bible. Seek guidance from a Christian friend. Attend a Bible-believing church, uh, a Bible-believing truth. Uh, not truth. Bible-believing truth-teaching church. Okay, there we go. Ask questions, start praying. So there's a number of things that are involved in actually opening the door. And I'm only going to touch on one of them this morning. We can look at a few others later. But the first thing I want to, uh, to draw to your attention is that you cannot wait for some convenient time. Anything but a prompt response is an indication that you have something more important to attend to. So like that Chulamite woman, Instead of, um, well, unlike her, instead of, oh, this and oh, that and oh, that, and then finally you get to the door and then the beloved's not there anymore. Don't make excuses. When God calls, do something about it. 
tomorrow is not good enough. It says in Hebrews 3, 7, to, uh, 7 and verse 15, that if you hear the Lord's voice, do not harden your heart as you did in the rebellion. And let's read that in context. It starts off. So as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. And what is hardening your hearts? Hardening your hearts is doing nothing. You hear his voice and you don't obey. During the time of testing in the wilderness, where your ancestors tested and tried me, though for 40 years they saw what I did. That is why I was angry with that generation. I said their hearts are always going astray. They have not known my ways. So I declared on my oath, an oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily. We need encouragement. We need fellowship. As long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the end. As it's just been said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. And that's in Hebrews 3. In Hebrews 4, the same scripture comes up again. God has, God again set a certain day, calling it today. This he did when a long time later he spoke through David, as in the passage already quoted. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden his hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following the example of disobedience. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. How do you hear God's voice? You hear God's voice through his word. It is through his word that our hearts are cut in two, dividing the soul and spirit, judging the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. And when God does that, we need to do something about it. Psalm 95 is the verse that is being quoted there by the author to the Hebrews, for he is our people. We are, for he is our God. We are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. Today, if you would hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. I would go as far as saying that today is not good enough, that the time to open the door is right now. You remember how when Paul was giving his defense before Agrippa, he says, I'll call for you at some convenient time. For many people, today is not convenient. Right now, it's not convenient. It's, they've got other things to do. Remember the Shulamite woman. When she finally stopped making excuses and got out of the bed to open the door, her beloved was no longer there. Can you imagine your future spouse, the love of your life, asking you to come and visit or telling you that she's going to come visit or he's going to come visit, and you make a whole lot of excuses to put the visit off. I'm washing the car. I'm doing the washing. I'm mowing the lawn. I'm tired. I'm going to sleep in. Yet these and many more of the excuses that are used to avoid meeting with the lover of your soul. Those are the excuses that people use for not coming to church and many more. So as we've seen, one of the ways to open the door to the Lord is fellowship with our fellow brothers and sisters, getting into a Bible-believing, truth-teaching church. This is a truth many ignore, mainly, because of offense, but also because there are other priorities, other things that are more important. 
Do you really believe that the Lord can accept you not having a desire to fellowship with the rest of the body of Christ that he purchased with his own blood, that he loves dearly? We are called to be like Jesus. Aren't we supposed to love what and whom he loves? If Jesus is so in love with your brothers and sisters in Christ that he died for them, why, don't, why do you have a problem with them? Why do you somehow have issues with people that Jesus loves desperately? When perhaps you're the very instrument that he wants to use to change the things that need changing in their lives. I have a theory. This is Lindsay van Sparentak speaking. And uh, I enjoyed this and I want to read this as we close. I have a theory. For so long, the enemy has tried to get God's children to turn their back completely to the Lord. But it's a hard sell to convince someone to go from love to hate that quickly. Instead, he's found it much easier to distract us from God. We now have Netflix, filling the time we used to use to read our Bibles. The world's constant noise distracts us from praying. And if we're being honest, it's so much easier to skip out on church than to get up and go on a Sunday morning. But you know what? We're stronger than that. We're not going down without a fight. It's time to take back what's ours. In order to do that, we need to look at our Sunday mornings, uh, Sunday morning excuses, square in the eyes and tell them to hit the road. So without further ado, here's my list of top 10 worst excuses for missing church. I overslept. The Broncos game is on earlier. Now, obviously, this is an American um, article, so we could find something to relate to in our situation. I lost track of time. It's my only day to sleep in. I connect with God better on the golf course. Nature trails. Ah, uh, yeah, laugh there from some guilty party. <laughs> I connect with God better on the golf course, nature trails, and at the beach. I like the beach one. My kids' traveling sports team only plays on Sundays. I'll just listen to a sermon via podcast. So all of those watching by Zoom, this is for you. It's too far to drive. I don't feel like going. I'm doing fine. I don't need church. I'm just going to look at two of those. Um, and give you her, um, I don't even know, Lindsay, if it's a man or a woman, podcasts are on the short list of things I love. I seriously listen to at least three a day, and a lot of those are sermons. But it's time to set the record straight. No matter how thankful I, have and I am to have world-renowned teaching at my fingertips, podcasts aren't a replacement for church. There's so much power in being in community having that support system of believers, always being surrounded by a group of people who love you and can hold you accountable. So please keep on listening to your sermon podcasts for extra teaching throughout the week or even to catch up if you miss the occasional Sunday. But let's all make it a priority to find community within a church. I don't feel like going. There have been so many times that I've woke up Sunday morning and didn't feel like going to church. Sometimes I stayed home. But when I went, one of two things would happen. Either I heard a sermon that was so impactful that I feel like God was speaking directly to me, or I was a sluggish, lame, oh, the entire time at church. While one of these situations is far more glamorous than the other, both are important. In the first situation, the enemy was trying to stop God from speaking the truth into my life, and I didn't let him. In the second, I learned to worship God even when I was tired, groggy, or not feeling, or just not feeling it. And that, my friends, is critical. There will be times in life when we are dragging our feet to church, or to read our Bible, or to pray. But every time we push through those feelings, we're getting another opportunity to connect with God. Many Christians have no desire for God himself. They want answers and they want solutions for their problems. To them, that's what prayer is. But this is what Oswald Chambers says. 
The meaning of prayer is that we get hold of God, not of the answer. So when God wants you to pray, when you've got problems, the answer to your real need is connecting with God. That's what happened with Paul. God didn't give him what he wanted. He prayed three times to have that thorn taken away in his flesh. But he connected with God. And God said, don't worry, Paul. My grace is sufficient. You can do this. I'm not going to take your problem away. I'm leaving it there to keep you humble. Have you heard him knocking today? The TLB version says, Revelation 3.20, look, I've been standing at the door and I'm constantly knocking. If anyone hears me calling him and opens the door, I will come in and fellowship with him and he with me. And then Isaiah 55, 6, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Don't be like the Shulamite, Shulamite woman who think you can put it off, even for a short while. I'm not talking about tomorrow. I'm talking about today. Sometimes the Lord speaks to us. He tells us to do something, and we're going to do it. We're going to do it just now. We need to allow the Lord to speak into our hearts and lives and to obey him.